company they need for the NHS, then they have to vote SNP tomorrow to deliver it. We now move to First Minister's question. Question one, Keza Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland and maybe a bit of last minute campaigning. Keza Dugdale. Before the 2010 general election, the First Minister's predecessor encouraged people across the UK to deny a Scottish Labour Prime Minister a majority. Can the First Minister tell us what happened next? First Minister. Well, in the 2010 election, uh, I recall Labour's message being to the people of Scotland that they should vote Labour to keep out the Tories. What happened next? Scotland voted Labour and the Tories got in. So my message tomorrow is this. Vote SNP to make Scotland's voice heard and then use that voice for better politics at Westminster. Professor Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. President Officer, I'll tell you what happened next. We got a Tory government that opposed austerity on our country. And, and they stood Order. by whilst working parents had to rely on charity to feed their kids. Yep. The First Minister might not like the truth, but it's a fact that Alex Salmond spent the last general election telling people to vote against Gordon Brown's Labour government. That was a Labour government led by a Scottish Prime Minister and a Scottish Chancellor. In this election, the First Minister, unsurprisingly, tells people in Scotland to vote for the SNP and against Labour. But she urges people in Wales to vote for Plaid and against Labour. And she calls on people in England to vote for the Greens and against Labour. For someone who says she wants a Labour government, she has a funny way of showing it. So let me ask the First Minister. Let me ask the First Minister a very simple question. What is the best way to get a Labour government? Is it to vote for Labour or against Labour tomorrow? First Minister. I think Kezia Dugdale, I'm not sure this is her intention. I have to assume it's not her intention, but she's kind of making my point for me here. You see, because in 2010, Scotland did end up with a Tory-led government, a Tory-led government that has done real damage to Scotland and to individuals and communities across Scotland. And here's the thing, Scotland voting Labour in 2010 did not stop that Tory government. It did not protect Scotland against that Tory government. It didn't protect Scotland against the bedroom tax, just like Labour MPs in the past couldn't protect Scotland against the Tory poll tax. So I think tomorrow we should do something different. I think we should vote SNP tomorrow to send a big team of SNP MPs to Westminster to stand up for Scotland in a way Labour MPs never, ever have, Order. to make Scotland's voice heard and to make sure that is a voice for better policies, like an end to austerity, whether that austerity is being proposed by the Tories or by Labour. And the question, I think, for Labour, presiding officer, is this. If we, as I hope we do, wake up on Friday morning with an anti-Tory majority across the UK, is Labour willing to work with the SNP to kick the Tories out, or are they going to stand back and watch David Cameron get right back into Downing Street? Mr. Dale. Mr. Dale. Officer, the First Minister says she wants the Tories out, but she is fooling no one because she said that the SNP would defeat a Labour budget, but she could only do that with Tory votes. Her deputy has said that the SNP could defeat a Labour Queen's speech, but you could only do that with Tory votes. We've been here before, President Officer, in this very chamber. When the SNP voted with the Tories against the living wage, yeah. when they voted with the Tories against a rent cap, and when they voted with the Tories against a ban on Order. exploitative zero hours contracts, why was it? Why was it that when we were on the side of working people in Scotland, the First Minister was on the side of the Tories? First Minister. Well, again, for the avoidance of any doubt, let me just make this very clear. If there was a budget brought forward by a Labour government that sought to continue Tory austerity and damage 
the most vulnerable people in our society, Order. then SNP MPs at Westminster Order. would not vote for that budget because we want an end to austerity. That wouldn't bring down the government, but it would send them away to think again and come back with a better budget. A budget that lifted people out of poverty, a budget that protected our National Health Service and our public services. And that, presiding officer, is the value of having a big team of SNP MPs at Westminster. We can lock the Tories out of government, but then we can make sure that the Tories are not simply replaced by a Labour Tory light government, they're replaced by something better. And can I just remind Kezia Dugdale of this? It was Ed Miliband on live television last Thursday who said this, that he would rather not have a Labour government than work with the SNP. So can Kezia Dugdale confirm to me today, and I'm asking her a direct question here, if there is an anti-Tory majority on Friday morning, will Labour work with the SNP to get the Tories out, or will Labour stand back and watch David Cameron waltz back into Downing Street? Yes, that's a deal. President officer, the First Minister has a cheek to describe the Labour Party as Tory light. There will be more progressive policies in the first week of an Ed Miliband government than there have been in eight years, eight years of an SNP government. And David Cameron has said himself that he just needs one more seat than Labour across the UK to stay in office. Just one seat. We can vote for Labour on Thursday and start the process of changing our country on Friday, abolishing the need for food banks, calling time on zero-hour contracts, investing in our NHS, guaranteeing jobs for our young people, increasing the taxes for the rich and sharing that wealth across the whole of the United Kingdom. That's the kind of change that you only get with a Labour government. Isn't it the case that if you want a Labour government, you have to vote Labour tomorrow? First Minister. Well, the simple... The fact of arithmetic is this. If on Friday morning there are more Labour and SNP MPs in the House of Commons than there are Tory MPs, the only way that David Cameron and the Tories get back into number 10 Downing Street is if Ed Miliband and Labour hold the door open for them. I'm very clear. If there's an anti-Tory majority, the SNP will want to work with others to keep the Tories out. And you know, we've heard all of this from Labour before. Kezia Dugdale talks about zero-hours contracts, and I agree we need to get rid of exploitative zero-hours contracts. Tony Blair, Tony Blair promised that 20 years ago, and under his government, zero-hours contracts increased by 40%. Order. So the thing is, presiding officer, it's not enough for Scotland just to get rid of the Tories tomorrow. Of course we want to do that, but we must make sure that the Tories are replaced by something better than the Tories. And that's what a big team of SNP MPs can secure. An end to the Tories and a better government, a bolder, better, more progressive government to go in its place. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, <laughs> no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. We know who the First Minister wants to be Prime Minister on Friday morning. She wants Ed Miliband to be Prime Minister. And that's the man that Alex Salmond described as oh, the uh... weakest Labour leader I've seen in my political career. And for once, I agree with Alex. So can I ask... Why does the First Minister want the weakest Labour leader in recent history to become Prime Minister? Can she tell me the top three things that make him the right man for the job? <laughs> First Minister, I'll tell you the top thing. He's no a Tory. <laughs> and I want the Tories out of office. Because you know what? Order. You know what? David Cameron's Tory-led government, and this is a serious point, has been devastating for vulnerable people across our country. David Cameron's Tory-led government has pushed more children into poverty. It has undermined our public services. It has held back our economy, and I want to see the back of it tomorrow. But just as I've said to Kezia Dugdale, I don't want David Cameron's 
Tory government to be replaced by Ed Miliband's Tory light government. I want a better government for Scotland. And the only way tomorrow we can make Scotland's voice heard, the only way tomorrow we can put an end to austerity, protection for public services, a stronger economy right at the heart of the Westminster agenda is to vote SNP. Because here's the truth. The more seats the SNP wins tomorrow, the more power Scotland will have. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. If I had a pound for every time she said Tory today, I'd be on her wages. Uh, and that was it. That was the reason she wanted to put Ed Miliband into government, is because of her hatred of the Tories. And you know what? I want people to vote positively tomorrow for an economic recovery that's created 100 Scottish jobs every day since we came to power for a plan that's left fewer children in workless households than we've ever seen, for a government that will always back the union just as Scots voted for last year. Of course Nicola Sturgeon doesn't want to put Ed Miliband in Downing Street because she thinks it will push independence further away. It's because she thinks it will bring independence closer. It's so she can hold a weak Labour Party to ransom and divide our nation forevermore. She and I both know there will be no post-election deals between our two parties. So isn't it the case, presiding officer, that while her party might be the party of independence, the Scottish Conservatives are the only party you can trust to safeguard the union? First well, Minister. Ruth Davidson's perhaps stumbled across something because it was interesting, was it not, that Kezia Dugdale didn't talk about independence today, which must be the first day in this election campaign. Labour hasn't talked about independence. Maybe they've read the reports of the University of Edinburgh research that have been reported in the papers today, which found when Labour brings up the issue of independence, it increases support for the SNP. <laughs> Making independence an issue, says the researcher, penalises Labour because voters perceive it as then being closer to the other unionist parties. In other words, it reminds voters of the Labour-Tory yeah. alliance. Well, tomorrow we've got an opportunity to do something better for Order. Scotland. And where, where I will uh, try to find a note of agreement with Ruth Davidson is on this point. I agree people should vote positively tomorrow. I agree people should vote positively tomorrow for a strong voice for Scotland in Westminster, for an end to austerity, for stronger investment in our public services and for a fairer economy that works for the many, not the few. That's why I say to everybody across Scotland, presiding officer, regardless of how they voted in the referendum, even if they've never voted SNP before, I say it to people in every corner of this country. Tomorrow is our opportunity to come together as a country to make our voice heard in Westminster louder than it has ever been heard before. Will Rennie. Um, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Will Rennie. Uh, I have put the case that the Liberal Democrats stand for stability and unity. <laughs> For our strong economy Order, and in the centre ground. For investment in education, the NHS and mental health. And respect for the result of the referendum last year. In contrast, the First Minister's evasion and avoidance shows that a vote for her party is a vote for the second referendum party. Or can she now, finally, at last, rule out a second referendum for a generation? First Minister. I am very, very grateful to Willie Rennie for giving me the opportunity again to directly address the people of Scotland on this issue. This election tomorrow is not about independence, even if, and I'm not making a prediction here, the SNP wins every seat in Scotland. That is not a mandate for independence or a second referendum. Tomorrow is an opportunity to make Scotland's voice heard, and we need Scotland's voice to be heard more loudly than ever before, because Willie Rennie may try to make that positive case for the Liberal Democrats, and good luck to him as he tries to do so. But unfortunately for him and his party, people know that over the past five years, what his party has been doing is standing shoulder to shoulder with a Conservative government damaging the poorest in our society. And that is why tomorrow I don't think the verdict of the Scottish people on the Scottish Liberal Democrats will be a particularly happy one for Willie Rennie. Willie Rennie.
Well, that, that's very interesting, but that's not what she said to the Guardian this morning. Oh. She was very clear, I'm not going to rule it out. That's not what she said before last September. Now she expects people to believe her this time. We know her colleagues are on manoeuvres for a second referendum. Yeah. But the First Minister can sort this out now. Order, she Mr. has the capacity Rainey. to show leadership on this. Will she rule out serving as First Minister in a Scottish Government that holds a second referendum? Will she rule that out? First Minister. I think from what I've seen this week, it's actually been Ruth Davidson on manoeuvres sitting astride <laughs> her tank, which I have to say, albeit we're in uh, opposing, uh, opposing political parties, I thought it was a splendid uh, photo call. Uh, but <laughs> not sure it'll win many votes, but there you go. Look, Willie Rennie is clutching at straws here. I'm happy, as we are right now, less than 24 hours before the opening of polls in this uh, unique, perhaps watershed general election to let the Scottish people have their say. I'm very clear what this election is about and is not about, and I'll let people in Scotland judge. This election is not about independence. That's why it is an opportunity for people, regardless of how they voted in the referendum and regardless of how they voted in past elections. This is an opportunity for us to unite as a country, for us to come together and make our voice heard. Only by voting Order. SNP tomorrow will Scotland's voice be heard loudly and clearly in Westminster. And then we will have a team of SNP standing up for an end to austerity and stronger public services. That's the opportunity we've got as a country tomorrow. Let's grab it. Yeah. Question four, Stuart Maxwell. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government is making on widening access to university for young people from the most deprived communities. First Minister. Well, in the programme for government, I set a long-term target for government and for our universities to eradicate the inequality in access to higher education so that a child born today in one of our most deprived communities will, by the time he or she leaves school, have the same chance of going to university as a child born in one of our least deprived communities. That's why this year we've doubled funding to the Impact for Access Fund, which encourages people from disadvantaged backgrounds to go to university. Our commitment to free tuition benefits over 120,000 undergraduate students every year and there has been a 40% increase in the proportion of 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged backgrounds accepted to universities since 2007. Stuart Marshall. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer and welcome the progress that is being made in getting students from less well-off areas into higher education, while at the same time agreeing with her that there is still much more to do. As part of that ongoing effort, is the First Minister able to provide me with detail on the programme of work that the Widening Access Commission will now undertake? First Minister. I think Stuart Maxwell is absolutely correct when he says that there's much more to do. I am uh, not in any way complacent about this. I genuinely want every young person in Scotland to have the same chance to go to university. I want young people from our most deprived communities not just to have a better chance, but to have the same chance as any other child in Scotland. So, uh, in order to remove barriers to access, we first have to understand more fully what they are. That's why we've established the Widening Access Commission under the convenership of Dame Ruth Silver. The Commission, uh, just to address the uh, question directly, the Commission met for the first time last week. A key part of its work will be to engage more widely with those who can relate through their own experiences uh, what needs to change to meet the ambition that we've set. And I look forward to receiving the Commission's final report in the spring of next year. Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I also welcome the Commission and the membership, which I think uh, is first class. Uh, we do uh, need to see the full remit uh, for the Commission's work, though. And in the meantime, can the First Minister confirm that the Commission will look at the impact on widening participation of Scotland having the lowest student grants in Western Europe and student debt being highest among students from poorer backgrounds, uniquely in the United Kingdom? First Minister. I hope we can strike some consensus across this chamber on this issue because I think we all I think we all agree about the importance of this but can I just point out to Ian Gray that it was not 
this government, but in US Scotland that described the Scottish Government student support package as, and I quote, the best support package in the whole of the UK. The latest student loan company figures, which were published in June last year, show that average student loan debt in Scotland is the lowest in the UK, uh, £7,600 in Scotland, compared to more than £20,000 in England, £17,000 in Wales, and more than £16,000 in Northern Ireland. So those are the, the facts, and it would, I think, uh, serve us all well to remember them. Uh, but I want the Widening Access Commission to have the ability to look at any issue it wants, because I am absolutely serious about the determination of myself and this government to close the inequality gap. I know, as many of us across this chamber know from our own personal experience, the importance of good education. I, I can't speak for anybody else. I know I wouldn't be standing here right now without it. And I'm determined that every young person in Scotland, regardless of their background, gets the same chances in life that I did. Question five, Neil Findlay. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on fracking. First Minister. Uh, we are taking an evidence-based approach to fracking. Uh, that's why we've got a moratorium in place to ensure that it can't uh, happen while we're looking uh, further at a variety of issues. We will undertake a full public consultation, listen to the voices of concerned communities and undertake further research. This cautious and evidence-led approach to unconventional oil and gas is in direct contrast to what I would describe as the gung-ho approach of the uh, UK government and indeed the refusal of the Labour Party to support a moratorium when that was put forward in the House of Commons. Neil Finn. Thanks for that reply. Since January, I've been pursuing a freedom of information request with the Scottish Government to try and bring into the public domain the Scottish Government's dealings with INEOS at Grangemouth and their plans for fracking. That request has been refused because, and I quote, uh, because of and I quote, the sensitive nature of some of the discussion. Given that, according to INEOS, they had a very positive relationship with the former First Minister and met him on numerous occasions, will the First Minister now order the release of this information so that the Scottish uh, people can see exactly what plans the Scottish Government have to facilitate, facilitate INEOS's desire to frack across the Central Belt? First Minister. Well, as the member knows, there is a, a statutory process to go through for freedom of information requests, and the government will comply with that process. On the question of ENEOS, ENEOS, uh, in case it has escaped uh, the notice of Neil Finlay, is a major employer in Scotland. Surely anybody in this chamber, and certainly everybody outside this chamber, would want any First Minister and any government to seek to have a positive relationship with an employer uh, who provides so many jobs in Scotland. And I make no apology for seeking to do just that. And the fact that Labour questions that perhaps tells you everything you need to know about Labour, Labour's unfitness to hold office in this Parliament. But can I also say that positive relationship will not influence uh, the position that the Scottish Government comes to on fracking. Uh, we will carefully go through the evidence consistent with that precautionary and evidence-based approach that I have described. And we will take decisions that are in the broader and the widest possible uh, interest of the people of Scotland, because that is also what people of us are right to expect its government to do. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Communities across Scotland who have been threatened by fracking and other forms of unconventional gas are impatient to see a moratorium turn into a full permanent ban. But they cannot understand, and nor can I, why the Scottish Government has not included the even riskier form of unconventional gas, underground coal gasification, in this evidence-based uh, approach or its moratorium. Why not? First Minister. As Patrick Harvey will be well aware, there are different technologies uh, at stake uh, there, but you know, we consider, uh, continue to consider properly all of these issues. And the reason why, I, I know people are impatient to see a moratorium turned into a ban, those who, for understandable reasons, oppose fracking. But if we were to do that before doing all of the proper work, we wouldn't be taking an evidence-based approach, just as we wouldn't be taking an evidence-based approach if we hadn't had the moratorium. So we are striking the right balance, and we will continue to strike the right balance and take into account all of the right issues before coming to final views. And uh, part of the work we are doing, as Patrick Harvey is well aware, is a public consultation exercise. And that gives every member of this parliament and all of their constituents in areas that would, if fracking was ever to go ahead, be affected by fracking, the opportunity to take part. And I would hope people across the chamber would welcome that. Margaret Fraser. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, on Monday, the leading Scottish engineering company, Weir Group, announced a new joint venture with Rolls-Royce to produce an integrated power system to make fracking more efficient. Can the First Minister explain to us how the SNP Government's indefinite moratorium on fracking will help a successful Scottish company like Weir Group, who want to expand, create jobs and grow the economy? First Minister. I want to support, and as a government, we've got a very good record in supporting companies uh, to locate in Scotland, to expand in Scotland, to succeed and prosper in Scotland, because uh, the economy and the jobs of thousands, tens and hundreds of thousands of people depend on that approach, and we will continue to do that. But, you know, I know Murdo Fraser takes a, a particular view on uh, issues of unconventional gas, but I think it is right, as the Scottish Government, to take a precautionary approach. There are a number of concerns that have been raised about health impact, about environmental environmental impact about the rights of communities who would be affected by fracking to be properly and meaningfully consulted. Now, I'll leave it to Murdo Fraser and the Conservatives to argue to those communities as to why they shouldn't have a voice in taking these decisions. But the Scottish Government will continue to take a precautionary, evidence-based approach because, fundamentally, it's the right way to do it. Chuck Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the First Minister's comments on the need for public consultation and, indeed, the moratorium. Can she provide an update on the devolution of licensing of onshore oil and gas extraction to the Scottish Parliament as recommended by the Smith Commission? First Minister. Well, the devolution of powers over onshore oil and gas licensing, I think, represent a significant increase in the ability of the Scottish Government to determine our own path for onshore oil and gas. Following the Smith Commission Heads of Agreement and the subsequent UK Government publication of the draft clauses and command paper, uh, the Scottish Government is awaiting further discussions with the incoming UK Government to determine the full extent of the devolution of these powers prior to the introduction, I hope, of a Scotland Bill later this year. And obviously Parliament will be kept fully informed of progress on that and will have the opportunity to contribute as appropriate. Question six. Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Prasani. I was said to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the increase in Scotland's population. First Minister. Well, I'm delighted that Scotland's population has risen again and is now at its highest ever level, over 5,300,000. In the last year, we've seen a significant increase both in the number of people coming to Scotland from the rest of the UK and indeed from further afield, highlighting just how attractive Scotland is as a place to live in, work in, study or invest in. Not only that, but over two-thirds of those coming to Scotland from overseas are aged between 16 and 34, showing the value of migration and helping to grow our working age population. Roderick Campbell. I thank the First Minister for her answer. She'll be aware that 48% of migrants from the rest of the UK are aged 16 to 34. Despite lots of stories during the referendum that people would be put off coming to Scotland, it's clearly the case that young people in particular continue to seek to study, live and work in Scotland. Regardless of the result tomorrow, would the First Minister agree to continue to extend the hand of friendship to people elsewhere in the UK? First Minister. Yes, I do, and I always will. Scotland welcomes the contribution New Scots make to our economy and to our society, whether they come from overseas or from just over the border. The latest population figures show that Scotland's net migration gain from the rest of the UK was approximately 9,600. That's a significant contribution to the overall population increase. I, I believe, and I, again I would hope this is a view shared across the Chamber, uh, Scotland should always be welcoming to people who want to come and live here, whether they want to come from other parts of the UK or from further afield. We are a nation of emigrants as well as a nation of immigrants. People who come here make a significant contribution to our economy and to our society, and we should welcome them. Annabel Goldie. Presiding officer, given these population increases <coughs> mirror closely existing projections, does this not strengthen the validity of forecasts on Scotland's ageing population, in particular the Scottish Government's report Demographic, Demographic Change in Scotland, and make the well-documented failure of the Scottish Government's change fund to reshape care for older people even more stark? First Minister. I am not sure I entirely follow Annabel Goldie's train of thought or logic there, but if, I, if that's my fault and I've maybe missed the premise of her question, she should feel free to write to me and I'm happy to address it uh, fully. If Annabel Goldie heard what I said in my uh, original answer, over two-thirds of people coming to Scotland from overseas are between 16 and 34. In other words, 
the boost our working age population. And one of the ways in which Scotland, in common with many other countries across the world, have to deal with our ageing population, and let's never forget our ageing population is a good thing, something to be celebrated, because it means people are living longer. But the way we deal with that is to grow our working age population. So these figures are good news in many different ways, but not least because it actually helps our ability to ensure that we can cater for a population that thankfully is living longer into old age. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to portfolio questions. So question number one is from Rob Gibson, but I'll give a few moments for people to just settle down first. If you are leaving the chamber, could you do so quickly and quietly?